we're going to do, we're going to try something a little bit new. We're going to show a few of the films and then have discussion related to it. So it's kind of going to be a little bit up and down and we're going to talk. The question was, is the producer an artist? Uh, is creative vision only the purview of the director? Creativity and vision in film is so often attributed to the director as a sole auteur. Can we rethink creativity in, one, in collaborative terms? The idea and image of auteur tends to be one of the singular genius, one with creativity mystically divine from above. And while acknowledging that the existence of geniuses living amongst us is possible, <laughs> most creative production results from a mixture of hard work, luck, and managing hard resources such as money, and soft resources such as fragile egos. <laughs> it is the producer who often drives all this while helping guide the creative vision of the film forward. Now, Michael Fukushima has been a great uh, friend to the film festival for years. He's visited, us, visited with us many times over the years and has produced many of the films that we've shown. We would show films and keep seeing Michael's name. So. <laughs> so last year, Michael participated in one of our industry panels uh, about the future of Asian North American media. It was clear to me that Michael had thoughts on the matter and more, and was decidedly providing the perspective of an artist. Today is far from a retrospective or lifetime achievement award. Michael's in the midst of an, an impressive run producing award-winning animated films and pushing innovation with collaborators. Dimanche, which you will see today, was nominated for an Academy Award in 2012, and his NFP NHK co-production collaboration with Koji Yamamura, Moy Bridges Strings, seen that relation last year, has recently won the Firebird Prize at the Hong Kong International Film Fest, and a Silver McKeldy Award at the Bilbao Documentary and Short Film Festival. And his current projects include Anne-Marie Fleming's new musical comedy short, Big Trees, and an adapta adaptation of Heather O'Neill's short story, The End of Pinky. So today we'll see a number of award-winning films that Michael's produced, and we'll look to unpeel the layers of creative process with him, and Howie and Lillian will join us for that. And uh, as moderating this uh, discussion. So, um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Michael, who's going to introduce his film. It's a huge honor for me to be here. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm speechless. Uh, and I was uh, overwhelmed when Aaron proposed it to me. I'm a little bit terrified uh, as well. Uh, as a producer, I'm, uh, I'm more than happy to talk about the films I produce and to talk about filmmakers I work with, uh, but I, I have lost a little bit the ability to talk about myself uh, personally. So uh, I suspect Howie and Lillian uh, have uh, very sharp probes to uh, probe some of the secrets from, uh, from outside of me. I hope they're not too sharp. Um, yeah, so uh, it's uh, it's. It's a nice program of films and hopefully a, an interesting bit of conversation. Aram and I put the program uh, together. Uh, the film, the first film we're going to see is my directorial debut with the National Film Board of Canada uh, back in 1992. I was invited to the NFB in 1990 uh, to make this film. There were a, a whole series of the wonderful serendipitous convergences that got me to the NFB um, and uh, took me about two years to make this 18 minute uh, film. It's an animated documentary. It's uh, about my father, Minoru. Uh, it's about his experiences during and after the internment of Japanese Canadians during the Second World War and his return. Oh, well, I guess I should keep going in. Um, uh, yeah, and his return to Canada. It, um, and like I said, it was finished in '92. It did the rounds. It, uh, you know, it won a couple of hot dogs. '92 or '93 was the first year of the Hot Dogs Festival, and uh, um, uh, somehow managed to win a couple of prizes there. Uh, I'm not quite sure how, uh, but I think I think primarily it was because um, uh, there hadn't been that many. I don't think there have been more than two animated documentaries at that time, so it was, uh, uh, it was a new form. And, um, and uh, now, of course, animated documentaries are all, all over the place, and I love them, and I think they're great. And love testimonial films. Uh, so hopefully you will uh, get something out of this. Please bear in mind that it's almost um, 
20 years old, so technologically, it might seem a little bit rudimentary to you, especially if you are under 20 years old, <laughs> or if you're just around 20 years old. But for, for me, it was all groundbreaking stuff. It was all done by hand and shot on 35 millimeter film. <laughs>
to the story. You know, I was there. I was, uh, I was almost fresh out of college. I think I was 27 or 28. Um, I was not a documentary filmmaker. You know, I was a documentary, filmmaker. and it was at a time when there was huge debate in the documentary world about veracity. Who gets to tell stories? Who is a documentary filmmaker? And I just I said, what the hell are you asking me to do? I can't, I can't do this. Uh, but my producer had started life as a documentary producer. And he said, well, look, this is, um, this is an important story. And um, you, have, you have a talent that could, uh, that could make the story so much more accessible, uh, so much more poignant, and uh, be very subversive. Uh, it was Bill who, uh, who, who showed me the light that, that animation has a way of sneaking up on audiences and catching them unawares and um, having a greater impact uh, because of that, because audiences aren't expecting something like this. Um, and uh, you know, I I was young enough that I, I said, okay, let's let's give it a whirl. And, um, uh, yeah, I was, I was stunned at how successful it is. And so that kind of uh, gave you a, a first look into uh, being the producing process and uh, believing in, in people and uh, working as a team. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I think I think we're going to talk a little bit more about that. When we talk with uh, Howie and Lily. Yeah, it depends on the questions they ask. Well, <laughs> we'll see. Um, and, and we also will talk about your transition from a uh, director to a producer um, based on this experience and, and others. But uh, um, perhaps we can um, introduce the next films, uh, Flutter and Jamie Lowe, Small and Shy. I just want to note that uh, um, we had a little bit of technical difficulties with C Note, so we're actually not going to see that tonight. But you can see it on nfb.ca. So. Um, but, Apologies. Yeah, sorry about that. But, uh, maybe you can uh, introduce some uh, Flutter and Jane from Small and Shine. Uh, the films or the filmmakers? Uh, the films. Okay. Um, uh, Jamie Lowe's Small and Shy uh, was, I think, 97? <laughs> 2000 and something. 2000 and something. Okay. My apologies. I won't. Um, it, it, was, uh, it was part of a program uh, that we had in the animation studio uh, where we were, you know, the, the NFB is an earnest organization and uh, it, was, it was at that time um, senior management at the NFB realized, you know, we need to do something about the, the whiteness. You know, Michael, it's nice that you're here, but um, <laughs> we need to do something. So I said, well, you know, um, we, I, can, I, can, I can beat the bushes and I can find, you know, there are tons of uh, amazing uh, young uh, uh, non-white filmmakers, animation filmmakers out there. I can beat the bushes and I can find these people and I can invite them to come and make projects. But what kind of projects uh, should we do? You know, these are all going to be young, uh, relatively inexperienced filmmakers. And um, uh, the film board said, well, you know, let's, let's, let's take the safe route and uh, uh, we'll option a bunch of books by visible minority writers, children's books, and we'll adapt those into films. So, okay. so we tried that, and that was the first edition of this program that was called Tales Stories. And they were films for children, they were based on uh, existing children's books uh, written by non-white uh, writers. And it was uh, an okay program. I produced one of them. Um, uh, and then there, an opportunity came to make a second series, and I, I said, look, you know, the book idea, it's a, it's a great idea, and I love writers, but um, there's not a lot of books, interesting enough books out there that are gonna make great films. Why don't we open it up and invite uh, young filmmakers white filmmakers to pitch us ideas about uh, about the minority experience as they see it from some from the perspective of somebody who's in their 20s um, and maybe urban and uh, we 
we opened it up, and that's where we discovered Lillian, and uh, along with Jonathan Ng, who's also here. And they, they were part of this group that made just actually quite spectacular uh, uh, animated films for kids uh, about, you know, not, not specifically about being Asian, about being minority, but colored by their experience of being Asian. And then um, Howie's film Flutter uh, have, was, was one of those uh, great accidents. Howie, um, I was introduced to Howie uh, through the Hot House program uh, that I started and uh, co-created in 2002. He was in one of the early editions. And I, you know, I was just impressed to hell by the guy, um, and not just by his hair. <laughs> and, um, and he came, he, you know, a couple of years later, he came back and he said, I have this, I had this idea about this boy who runs and runs and runs and runs. And I said, wow, okay, where's he going? Well, he's just running. And I thought, okay, this, uh, this could be kind of interesting. Let's, let's, uh, let's see. And we developed it and uh, um, it turned into <coughs> this that is just, you know, just became this beautiful elegy poem about, about search, and about love, and about um, you know, how you just have to kind of dive into life, and life takes you. So, and I'm just so impressed that a kid as young as Howie would come up with a, with a project like this. So uh, those are the two films. That's great. That's great. I think uh, we'll let's see them now, shall we? Maybe you guys can uh, talk a little bit about your experience working with Michael on these films. Sure. Or ask him probing questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure talking about working with Michael won't just end up being uh, oh. gushing and, and <laughs> random uh, adjectives. Um, I, I generally like... There are good and bad adjectives. <laughs> I generally like to be uh, left alone, always. <laughs> um, and I, 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 at least with me, I think Michael sensed that. So he, he really, uh, the most, um, most surprising thing for me was, was learning what a producer does. Uh, and, um, and then learning that other producers afterwards don't work this way. But Michael, I think, really had a sense of uh, what my, my temperament was, and, and he sort of uh, gave me, uh, he gave me a lot of leeway, especially for someone who'd never uh, formed a study of animation before, and, and, and uh, I don't think he'd done really, really artsy, artsy kind of um, non-linear things in the past, for the most part. Um, the, uh, he, he just let me go off and work, and then uh, I would send him stuff when I felt like it was uh, sort of sort of worth looking at. And then um, I think my experience with the teachers that work best with me is they 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 don't necessarily say a lot, but they'll say one or two sentences that sort of open up um, a whole bunch of things and, and lead you to figure out the rest of the solution yourself. So. So Michael, is that, is that an approach that you generally have towards working with directors, or is it something that you tailor to the kind of temperament of the, of the director? Uh, no, it's, it's, uh, it's a style. It's, it's, uh, it's my style. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, getting, getting a gauge on a filmmaker's personality, and their working style, and their temperament is, is, uh, is fundamental uh, to being a good producer, for me, right? uh, because it is a, it's a relationship. And in case of animation, it can be like a two, sometimes three year long relationship, and it's pretty intimate. And you know, we both, the filmmaker and the producer, have investment in, uh, in the film, I mean, emotional or creative investment, not only financial. Um, and so, you know, it's crucial for me at, at one level to work with filmmakers, I think I can have that kind of long term relationship with, but also to. to a sense of, uh, of who they are. 
and how they how they work best. Because they're gonna, there's 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 no point in uh, producing somebody like Howie uh, who, who needs some space to make mistakes on his own and discover those mistakes by just constantly badgering him. It's counterproductive. It's he's going to walk away from the project broken, dispirited, uh, maybe never come back. And you know that's not what I want. I want to keep making films. So it, that that's that's a fundamental uh, piece of it. And um, you know, the, yeah, I, I I do like to talk. I, I do like to talk about films. I do like to critique them and, and pick them apart. Um, I find that quite enjoyable and fun. But it's not always productive and useful. And so my job is to gauge where uh, direct direct uh, critique is helpful and where just shining a light uh, in, in, a, in a place that the filmmaker had looked at will be more helpful to say, did you, uh, did you think about this? What about this possibility? How about, uh, how about trying something like this and letting them Lillian, how did how did the working relationship with Michael was explaining uh, uh, work in the process of you? Yeah, um, I remember actually when I first I moved to Montreal to work on Jamie Lowe, and when my first meeting with Michael in his office, he basically warned me that there would be possibly arguments where someone would be yelling and storming out of the room <laughs> and that that was okay and that was all part of the process and I thought, what what is going on? I, I really didn't realize that it could be that intense of a process and I don't think we actually did get into any sort of storming match but I think going into it actually when I first moved to Montreal, the story wasn't entirely fleshed out for the film and Michael actually gave me, I think, close to three to four months to still refine my story. And, and it took a very, very long time to really get to the right place. And um, I really respect Michael for giving me that space because I think that it must be hard to see issues and really just lead a director to figure out problems on their own and yet be able to provide constructive criticism. So I remember getting emails of analysis back on the film, and I think, Michael, you would you'd be able to identify the problem perfectly and then not give me the answer of how to solve it. And I would sit there going, like, what, what am I supposed to do now? And Tell me what to do, kind of Well, I think I, I wanted that. I wanted someone to give me some sort of definitive answer as to how to resolve the problem, and I think Instead, what I received was were suggestions, like Michael said, of what direction I could take to finally come to resolution, and and it was actually really great because it really forced me to internalize how, like, really push my own creative process as the director and make those definitive decisions, and yet at the same time have that influence as well. But what I'm curious about is the difference between working with a young filmmaker like like us and then working with more experienced filmmakers and I'm sure egos get involved in completely different ways and I'm wondering if you can expand on that. Well yeah, in, 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 there are tons of egos. <laughs> even the even the egoless producer has an ego. Um, you know, it, it's 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 um, there's often, I, my experience has been there's often very little difference between working with a veteran, uh, very confident filmmaker, and a younger, more emerging filmmaker. As long as uh, the situation is set up, as long as I have framed up the relationship, filmmaker producer correctly, and you frame the relationship. Triangular relationship between the filmmaker and the producer. In my case, the producer and the NFB, uh, because you know the, the two-way relationship and that three-way relationship are very important in an NFB context. And uh, the NFB is a very scary beast. It's 
is hearing these for veteran filmmakers, and it must be a terrifying place for younger filmmakers. And but but my my job, what I want, is for uh, filmmakers to not think about the film, but to only think about their relationship with me. Um, so uh, so you know once that's established, and once I have once a filmmaker is confident that I'm actually uh, their advocate, their champion, as well as uh, you know, the person who's going to challenge them on the decisions they're making, but for the good, for the, for the betterment of the film, once that has been established and they're comfortable, comfortable with that, uh, working relationships have tended not to be uh, vastly different. The only difference is that the more veteran filmmakers do tend to have a bit more self-confidence and uh, will more regularly say, yeah, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Or conversely, have the self-confidence to say, you know, I never thought of that. Yeah, let's give it a whirl. Whereas younger filmmakers uh, tend to have to go through the exercise of trying all the things first before we Oh, okay, that's going to work. That's genius. Or, uh, <laughs> that's horrible. What an idiot. Uh, 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 more veteran filmmaker already has a, has a, a, a tighter credit set. We're running a little short on time, so I, I want to um, set up uh, Dimanche. So, can you intro Dimanche? Uh, sure, I'll try to do it quickly. Then. <coughs> um, Dimanche uh, is by uh, young filmmaker Patrick Doyon from Montreal. Uh, much like how he got classically trained as an animator, uh, but uh, studied illustration and design uh, at uh, UCAM. He was, he was a trained as an animator? No. <laughs> no. He, 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 he did some work in animation after after he was doing that, he's an illustrator. Um, uh, uh, like Howie, uh, I first met Patrick through the Hawkins. He did, uh, he, I think he was in Contest 3, he made a charming film called Square Roots, came back with his proposal about uh, life as a child in rural Quebec in the summer. And uh, you know, I was just absolutely taken by it. And um, so I negotiated the deal with the French animation studio, I did a co-production uh, between the two studios. Um, and and as, you, as you said, it was uh, nominated last year for the Academy Short, short animation category. It won uh, the Pijuca in Quebec, which is the Quebec uh, film uh, film prize annual film prize. But uh, I was I was mentioning this to somebody when earlier today. Uh, Dimanche actually, when it was released, uh, many people at the NFB uh, pigeonholed it as a children's film. Right? If, if, you, if you haven't seen it, you'll see it. You can decide if it's a children's film. But it, it has a naive simplicity to it. So it, the film board wasn't really prepared to push it as hard as they would have pushed the capital A marketing film. But my marketing manager at the time, Christine Miller, she, you know, she saw it for what it was, and she aggressively pushed it uh, within the organization and, um, uh, and, and uh, convinced, uh, convinced the enemy to submit it to Berlin in the children's category. Still Berlin, where it won a Norwegian prize, um, and that changed everything. That changed the, the trajectory of that film completely. Had she not done that, it would have remained a children's film. Well, so should we take a look at the monster? Right. There was just so much we wanted to talk about, and there's so much more to talk about, so I hope that uh, if you see Michael around, you can chat him up a little bit more, and I really want to thank you for doing this, and it's such an honor to have you and show your films and, uh, and hear a little bit about what you, what you do, and uh, I want to hear more, so maybe we'll do part two next year. <laughs> okay, it's and a deal. You, and you're going to have more films on the way, so. That's okay. Well, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Festival. Thank you all. Uh, it's a pleasure. Yeah I, yeah, I wish we could talk more, I think.
as you can tell, I can talk about films forever. Yeah. So, thank you all for coming.